Welcome to PFT Tutor with Jeffrey Haynes. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. It's greatly appreciated. In this video, we're going to discuss how to perform a six minute walk test. While the six minute walk test is not a complicated test, there is a fair amount of confusion about how to perform it properly. And while the ERS and ATS jointly published a technical standard for the six minute walk test over 10 years ago, there is still a lot of variability in how it is conducted in different laboratories and clinics. The information I'm going to review is based largely on these two documents, the ERS-ATS Technical Standard of Field Walking Test and an ERS-ATS Systematic Review of Field Walking Test in Chronic Respiratory Diseases. Both were published in the December 2014 issue of the European Respiratory Journal and are open access so you can download these documents for free from the ERS website. To access these papers, just go to the European Respiratory Society website under ERS Publications, select the European Respiratory Journal under the Journals tab, and then search for Volume 44, Issue 6 in the archives. So what is a six-minute walk test anyhow? There seems to be some confusion about the very definition of what a six-minute walk test is. So a six-minute walk test helps to determine functional exercise capacity. It can tell us information about prognosis and response to therapy. A six-minute walk test is not designed to determine the need for supplemental oxygen and oxygen titration. Determining oxygen needs is a different test called an oxygen titration test. A six minute walk test and an oxygen titration test are not the same test. They are very different. The primary outcome of a six minute walk test is the distance walked in meters over six minutes. Where the primary outcome of an oxygen titration test is to determine whether or not a patient is a candidate for oxygen therapy and if so, how much do they need? While a six-minute walk test is sometimes referred to as a submaximal exercise test, in this study by Troosters, patients with COPD had identical VO2 max during a six-minute walk test in a cardiopulmonary exercise test. An interesting finding of this study is that achieving VO2 max was much more efficient during a six-minute walk test than a cardiopulmonary exercise test on a cycle ergometer with a lower CO2 production, respiratory exchange ratio, and minute ventilation. As I mentioned in the beginning, the six minute walk distance can provide insight into prognosis. In this study using data from the ECLIPSE trial showed that in patients with COPD, if the six minute walk distance is less than 334 meters, there was a much higher risk of death. Similar findings can be seen in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. In this study, a six minute walk distance less than 250 meters was associated with a higher risk of death. Before we review the proper way to perform a six-minute walk test, it's obviously important to identify patients who may not be good candidates to perform the test. The ERS ATS standards list absolute and relative contraindications for testing. I'm not going to bore you by reading these line for line. Some of the absolute contraindications are obvious, like recent myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolism or unstable cardiovascular status, acute respiratory failure or uncontrolled asthma, syncope, arresting Romare SpO2 85% or less, and mental issues like dementia where the patient is incapable of following directions. Relative contraindications include uncontrolled hypertension, arrhythmias, and orthopedic limitations that may affect their ability to walk. So how do you do it? Well, a six-minute walk test is not performed on a treadmill. A six-minute walk test should be performed in a low-traffic hallway with course markers placed at each end of the course. Ideally, the course should be 30 meters or 100 feet in length. The course length is important because a shorter course reduces the six minute walk distance. In this study of patients with COPD, the difference in six minute walk distance was 50 meters less when a 10 meter course was used instead of a 30 meter course. Why does a shorter course reduce the six minute walk distance? Because the patient spends more time turning around the cones. So just like a race car, Patients will cover more distance as a function of time with longer straightaways. For safety reasons, it's a good idea to position chairs around the course in case the patient experiences severe symptoms and needs to sit. We have a chair on each end of the course and one at the midpoint. Uh, patients rarely need to use them, but I think it creates a safer environment for testing. We also have the hallway labeled with meter markers in both directions because the last lap, when the six minute mark is achieved, will probably not be a full lap, it'll be a partial lap, and labeling the hallway makes it easier to determine the distance walked in that last partial lap. 
Other equipment you'll need for safety reasons is access to a phone or emergency activation button, oxygen, and an automated external defibrillator AED. You'll need a pulse oximeter to monitor SpO2 and heart rate during the test. You can use a wrist oximeter. What I do is to place the oximeter in a telemetry bag and the patient wears it over their head and on their shoulder like a satchel. You'll need to measure blood pressure before and after walking and then at the end of the test during the recovery phase. To monitor walking time, I use a stopwatch on my phone, which can also be used as a lap counter. It also allows you to monitor the patient's lap times. In, in this example, lap six was four seconds slower than lap two, so this can be used to encourage the patient to maintain a consistent lap time as best they can. The modified Borg scale is used to measure dyspnea intensity before and after walking and at the end of the test during recovery. A similar 0 to 10 scale is used to document the intensity of exertion during testing. To document, I draw a table on the blank side of the patient's face sheet, but you can also create a worksheet to use. We record SpO2 and heart rate every minute because that's how our software spreadsheet is configured. You can also use this to record symptom intensity, blood pressure, number of stops if the patient has to pause, keep track of the number of completed laps. In this example, I circled the highest heart rate and the lowest SpO2, which may occur earlier than the end of the test. Having standardized instructions is very important to make sure all the staff are explaining and performing the test in a similar way, and ideally you'd want them to be similar between different institutions. Here are the instructions listed in the ATS PFT manual. The object of this test is to walk as far as possible for six minutes. You will walk back and forth in this hallway. Six minutes is a long time to walk, so you will be exerting yourself. You will probably get out of breath or become exhausted. You are permitted to slow down, to stop, and to rest as necessary. You may lean against the wall while resting, but resume walking as soon as you are able. You will be walking back and forth around the markers. You should turn briskly around the markers and continue back the other way without hesitation. It is important um, to remember that the patient is allowed to stop uh, if they have to catch their breath, but you don't stop the clock. The clock keeps running, so it counts against them. So you should encourage them to resume walking as soon as they, they are able. This is a study published in CHESS that evaluated the impact of instructions on the six-minute walk distance in patients with IPF, other forms of interstitial lung disease, and pulmonary hypertension. Standard instructions are shown in the black triangles, which produces a larger six-minute walk distance than when the patient is instructed to walk leisurely, as shown in the red diamonds, or if the patient was asked to walk normally, as shown in the purple triangles. However, when the phrase walk as fast as you can was used, the six-minute walk distance was higher compared to the standard instructions, as shown in the green circles. This table compares the standard walk instructions to the walk fast instructions. On average, the fast walk instructions increase the six minute walk distance by 61 meters, which that's a lot. The change in heart rate increased by nine and the change in the Borg scale was slightly higher. All of these were statistically significant. The only parameter that it did not change significantly was the SpO2. These are the standardized instructions that we use. I modified them a little and included the word quickly so the patient is instructed to walk as far and as quickly as they can. The fast or quick language is included in the ERS ATS instructions, but I use it because the six minute walk distance will clearly be higher. Those are the instructions for the patient, but there's also an important instruction for the technologist. And that instruction is that you do not walk with the patient. You do not walk with the patient because they need to set their own pace. So we stand in the midway point of the course, watching the clock, giving encouragement and recording data. There are also standardized encouragement messages at one minute intervals during the test. And I count them down to a stop from 10 seconds left to go. Once you've started the test, it's important to recognize conditions which make it unsafe to continue. So an SpO2 less than 80%, a lot of people are surprised to hear that. They think, well, I should stop the test if it goes under 90. Actually, the six minute walk test has been shown to be very safe, even if you're less than 90%. So I do not stop a six minute walk test just because they've gone into the 80s. Uh, chest pain, air hunger, dizziness. If you notice that the patient is unsteady, they have sort of a staggering gait. Uh, people that have claudication with severe leg cramps. Uh, obviously, if they're diaphoretic or have an ashen appearance, you'd want to use one of those chairs and have them sit down. 
So at the end of the test, when you count them down to the six minute mark, you want to record the last partial lap, which I showed you is much easier if you label the hallway with uh, meter markers. You want to record the SpO2, heart rate, blood pressure, Borg scale, and perceived exertion. Now you can calculate the six minute walk distance. So it's going to be the total number of laps plus the last partial lap. So if you're using a 30 meter course, one lap is 60 meters. So if your patient did eight laps times 60, that'd be 480 meters. If the last partial lap was 20 meters, that would give you a total distance of 500 meters. We enter all the data into a spreadsheet in our PFT software. Um, as you can see, it records for every minute of the test. It has a spot for blood pressure and all the different variables that you'll be measuring. Then we submit this nice report into the EMR, which includes vital signs, six minute walk distance, the predicted distance, the lower limit of normal, and the percent predicted. It will also auto-populate a previous six minute walk distance. The percent change is included, and also a note about the MCID. The MCID stands for Minimal Clinically Important Difference. And the important difference in a six minute walk test is 30 meters. So if you've done a previous test and you're seeing that there's a change and you're trying to decide whether it's significant, 30 meters is the threshold to be a significant change. The 30 meter difference isn't arbitrary or just expert opinion, it's based on research. In this study, a 30 meter decline in six minute walk distance was associated with non-survival over a 12 month period. Not everyone is gonna have the available space for a 30 meter uh, course, and if that's the case, it's important to keep in mind that yes, your patients will have a lower distance, the clinically significant difference will also be lower. So this was a study that was done looking at the minimally important difference in a 20 meter course, and they found that the significant difference was 20 meters, not 30. I'm gonna share a couple of examples. Uh, in this six minute walk test, the patient walked 350 meters. Their last test, they walked 343 meters, so that's a change of seven meters, a 2% difference, and that would not be clinically important. This patient walked a total of 513 meters. Their last test uh, walk distance was 477 meters. That change was 36 meters, a 7% difference, and that is clinically significant. So we often think about things going the wrong way, but in this patient, their six minute walk distance improved. I mentioned percent predicted and lower limit of normal. So yes, you can use reference equations for the six minute walk test. Uh, there are some limitations, however. There is significant variability between equations. A lot of these are rooted in how they uh, perform the test and their methodology. Uh, most of the uh, reference equations are generated from adults. And it's important to keep in mind that longitudinal changes or changes over time may be more important than percent predicted. There are a number of reference equations to choose from. One of the limitations of many of these equations is the use of weight, which I have highlighted in yellow. We use the enright sherrill equations that does include weight, and I'm gonna share a case report in which the use of weight skewed the results pretty significantly. We had this case report published in the ERJ Open Research. It was a 79-year-old female whose chief complaint was dyspnea on exertion. She had been diagnosed with interstitial lung disease. She was also morbidly obese with a BMI of 45. She had normal baseline spirometry, but her DLCO was 50% predicted with a Z-score of minus 4.05. This table shows the patient's resting and max response. So at rest, her heart rate was 90 reached a max response of 139. At rest, she had no dyspnea with a Borg of zero, but that reached a max response of five. And a rumor SpO2 started off at 94% at rest, declined to 79% during the six minute walk, and she had to take three short breaks during the walk due to dyspnea. And as I mentioned earlier, remember the patient is allowed to pause, to stop, to catch their breath, but you don't stop the clock. The clock keeps running, so it counts against them. Her six minute walk distance was 228 meters, which is not very much at all. Um, when we applied Enright's reference equation, however, we were surprised to see that she exceeded the lower limit of normal of 139 meters. The predicted was 278, and her percent predicted was 
So that's a very unusual uh, finding since uh, she had to stop three times to catch her breath uh, and her oxygen saturation went to 79%. How could this be a normal result? As I mentioned, we use the Enright-Sherrill equation, which as you can see, uses height, weight, and age to predict the six minute walk distance. However, the participants in the Enright study were all of normal weight, so both men and women had a BMI less than 30. So applying Enright's equation, as I said, came out with a normal result 82% predicted. But what I did was I changed the equation in the software to use ideal body weight. And when I did this, the percent predicted went down to 53%. Um, and if you use other equations that are derived either from obese subjects or equations that do not use weight, her results are all abnormal. So yes, I would be cautious of patients who are very heavy or very gaunt um, when you're using these equations. Um, ideally, I would use an equation that doesn't include body weight. There's also this very inconvenient phenomenon called the learning effect. This means that patients may increase their six minute walk distance simply from gaining experience performing the test. In patients with COPD, the average increase in six-minute walk distance between the first and second test performed within 24 hours is 26 meters, so almost reaching that threshold for the minimal clinically important difference. For the patient's first test, it is recommended that two six-minute walk tests are performed when the test is used to measure change over time. Obviously, this can raise logistical and billing issues. And I think of some of our ILD patients who barely make it through the first walk and asking them to do it again in 30 minutes is a bit of a tall order. But it does affect the six-minute walk distance for sure. Lastly, patients can wear oxygen during a six-minute walk test. If they're going to use a tank, they'll be able to walk farther if they use a tank on a roller than as opposed to carrying the tank. Key points. The six-minute walk test is an important test that provides information about functional capacity, prognosis, and response to treatment. A six-minute walk test is not a test to qualify patients for oxygen or to titrate oxygen therapy. The six-minute walk test is greatly affected by how the test is administered. A 30-meter course is ideal, so the patient is not spending a lot of time turning around cones. Standardized instructions are important to obtain consistent results. The technologist does not walk with the patient. You let the patient set their own pace. And reference equations can be used, but changes over time may be more important. Thank you for watching PFT Tutor with Jeffrey Haynes. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification buttons, and we'll see you next time.